and still in the breakfast, the Controller General Nigeria Immigration Service, Mohamed Babandere, has implemented procedures for international flights resumption and visa payment. The Controller said this during a virtual meeting with stakeholders to address travel concerns and automation of travel work permits on Wednesday in Abuja. He said that the procedures were in line with the federal government's approval to commence international flights operation from September the 5th. The Murtala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, and Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, were earlier approved by the Minister of Interior, Rauf Aregbeshola, for the implementation. Issues concerning entry of migrants affected by the suspension of international flights and closure of land borders were also addressed. To take a look at this conversation, we have joining us live in studio, Adeni Yukunu, who's a public affairs analyst. Good to have yes, you. Good morning. Thank you I mean, it's good to have you in studio, thanks to COVID-19. We are easy now and we are mm. happy to have uh, some guests joining us live yes. in studio. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and then we also have joining us virtually, uh, Wale Shadare, who is the aviation editor for Daily Telegraph. Good to have you, Mr. Shadare. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. All right. Virtually, though, <laughs> we're happy to have you all the same. <laughs> all right. Yeah. We, will, we will begin the conversation. Uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Adeni, who's in studio, Mr. Kunurada, who's in studio, uh, to talk about this. First of all, I want to ask you, what's your assessment of you know, the protocols, everything that was put in place as we began international flights uh, last Saturday? Well, I think that um, it's okay that there's a guideline. Mm -hmm that wasn't imported regarding Nigeria, uh, you know, embarking on international flights. And I've said that because the health protocol that we've actually been practicing for the past five months, uh, without a doubt, was imported. Mm. So at least for once, we could say that this uh, guidelines regarding international flights is homemade, which means we thought out of the box by ourselves. Mm. But I if I take it, sorry, if I take a step backward, yes, when you say the protocols that we've been uh, practicing is important, what do yeah. you mean exactly? Well, if I if if you look at if you did your findings actually, um, and you do check, uh, even if they call those people who really research facts, conspiracy theories, I think they should perish that. If you did your research, or you find out that whatever is happening as far as the pandemic is concerned, is contained in the documents. Uh, put together by the Rockefeller Foundation since 2010. That's by the way. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, at the outbreak of COVID, we know how the shutdowns went, the strategy for the shutdown and oh, everything. Okay. So Nigeria followed the international procedures for lockdown, easing of lockdown. When they started talking about the first wave, the second wave, second wave, all those things were things that we saw over there. More or less like when Nigeria talked about, you know, the quarantine law mm -hmm. that they said they took from Singapore, that there are documents to show. So for the first time in my own very candid assessment, if somebody has another opinion, take me on in public and let's deal with it. For the first time since this COVID-19 started, this document as announced by Mohamed Babandeide and of course Hadi Sirika, who is the aviation minister, is what we actually churned out ourselves, which mm. I think it's positive for me. But you see, my concern in all of this is the fact that they still do not give positive COVID-19 results to the people that are touted or claim to have tested positive. Mm -hmm. I have interviewed three people, and I have been with one person who undertook the test less than one week ago. He tested negative. Okay. And the person who tested negative, as it were, was told by words of mouth. So there in, was no in, in the history. I, I'm saying that whoever is listening to me should challenge me mm -hmm. that when you tested positive, you were given your test results and you could take that test result to a doctor. Because don't forget that even the PCR test has been faulted at some point as very inconsistent. Mm -hmm. You see, the human body has in excess of about 8 trillion cells. We are all working germs. And the interaction we have, oftentimes, the relationship we have keeps us healthy because the body has the capacity to do a lot. COVID-19 is not unreal. Okay. But the lies of COVID-19 is a trillion times more than the reality of it. So I'm saying that it's important for us to understand that 
Health choices at this point is, is key. But the focus today is about international flights. Yeah. So I, I think it is very important to say this because I read what was released by the government in detail. Within 96 hours, uh, when you come into the country, uh, any symptoms, you have to be taken into isolation. You do another test. And that second test, the cost will be borne by you. Those are fair. Mm -hmm. But what I did not find in that document is, will the test results be given to you, soft copy or hard copy? It's not there. Okay. Except maybe there's a new publication. So I'm saying here that medically, and even Nigerian medical doctors mm -hmm. have disappointed me greatly. Please, I'm sorry that Shadow is online, but let yeah. me drop this before I'll you switch give to him. Him time to. In outside, outside Lagos, he took man no man for a medical doctor to get his test results. He had to know somebody, big shot the government. Why do you have to do that for the test? Hmm. So that is my concern in all this. All right. Thank you for yes, sharing please. that. Let's speak to uh, Mr. Shadari on the other end. Uh, we're talking about the process and the procedure. Is this not quite a tedious process? If I may ask you, depending on countries, you get quarantined for two or three days, yeah. then get into Nigeria another set of days before you are cleared. You, you almost spend your time that you've got uh, trying to clear yeah, I think yourself, it's so to speak. Very, very cumbersome for um, for this test to be carried out. Even um, I, I don't think a lot of people are even aware or know where to even do this test because a lot of them have had to call me to say, please, where can I do my PCR test? Hmm. And I'm beginning to wonder that uh, this shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be any difficulty for anybody. But I believe that um, the awareness, the information has not um, really been uh, put out there by uh, government and the respective agencies. It becomes so difficult because um, even for me, I was just, you know, uh, racking my head and say, oh, where do they do this PCR test? Where do they do all these things? Mm. You know, because even on 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 Saturday when flight resumed, there were a, a, a lot of confusion on um, what the test could be. Some don't even know before they got into Nigeria and they have to undergo another round of tests, which I believe that um, it, it wasn't necessary at all because whatever test that may have been done over there should be valid when they come in. What you just need to do is mm. show the certificate uh, that is duly signed by a recognized um, uh, medical institution. Mm. It becomes very difficult for people, but I believe as time goes on, uh, it will become easier for people to uh, know exactly what to do. Mm. And how because to do it. Because if we look at this um, coronavirus, uh, it's so it was it's so alien to us that we didn't even know what to do until uh, we begin to look at the things that are done from other clients. But I know we are getting it right. But we need more information. We need to simplify the process. We need to make it less difficult for people who are coming in. Right. I tell you, a lot of people are not even willing to travel now because of so many confusion of so many things that are you know, shrouded the, the Nigerian factor we always come to play in whatever we do. Uh, there was a time it was reported that uh, some people were cutting corners, some people were coming with fake um, certificate. But I think this should have been simplified now, should have been made easier for people to really know what to do when right. they get in or when they go to the country. Okay, we, we will come, I'll come to you again to talk about, you know, some flights that were suspended and to, you know, shed light on that. But before yeah. we, we do that, I, I just want to ask you, Mr. Kuno, how realistically sustainable is all of this process and this procedure that we are talking about? Uh, because one of the things he mentioned is how, it was, how rigorous it is. And I remember that very many times we talked about prepared, how ready are we to go on, you know, continue to resume flights. Does this show some kind of disconnect in terms of our, you know, maybe preparedness even before now? Okay, um, before we go into that, I'd like to, there's a particular thing that perhaps um, eluded him, which is that passengers who are coming can upload their uh, information. Mm -hmm. There's a particular portal that government has provided where you actually get accredited test centers you get the information from there. So that has been provided for by those governments. Okay. So those who perhaps... But how efficient? Are, well, I, I think I went to the portal and I think it's just simplified enough for people to put in their 
uh, information do. and definitely they will get whatever it is they need from there. Okay. Uh, but I'm talking about when the numbers increase and that the portal actually gets overloaded and maybe it, 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 it freezes as it's as, 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 we'll as come as up is with the network case. issues. Uh, issues and all of that. So these are part of the things that you consider. But, you know, it talked about the cumbersome nature of it. For instance, the UK government said something recently, I think that was last month, about people who had one to six months visa who should have traveled. They issued a publication that within the pandemic, if you're supposed to travel and your visa expires, mm -hmm. you are getting another visa for that. Uh, the federal government should also look at what has happened to people who have, don't forget we're talking about visa on arrival, yeah. as uh, brought about by this government so that they can facilitate businesses and investment. But I'm saying that what kind of provision has been made in that regard? Um, talking about the cumbersome nature of the process, I think it's mm -hmm. indeed cumbersome because when you come in with your test result, and don't also forget that um, we're talking about countries that unarguably have better medical facilities, Correct. who have better testing systems, who have tested more people. So telling them to come here and test again, especially where if you test negative, or positive rather, you have to be isolated, mm -hmm. you have to pay for that. I think that it's, it's really going to be a challenge. Don't forget that we are dealing with a lot of situations here that our medics have not been able to completely manage. Mm -hmm. So when you add the international bodies to it, how well have you provided for the kind of standard attention they need medically, apart from all of the things they have to do? Uh, don't forget that they talked about anybody who boards and doesn't have the test confirmed to have been done within 96 hours, yeah. that $3,500 will be the sanction. So I think that um, there should be a review, in my own very good estimation, where the particular places you, you've done your test are actually the ones that our own government accredits because we also have quacks. We have medical doctors. For instance, <laughs> in the US, uh, I think uh, last year, a calendar, you have about 250,000 deaths resulting from medical errors in the United States of America. Mm. So that alone tells you that no system is foolproof. But if we have medical centers that have actually been certified capable of doing such things over time with less mortality rates, then I think they could go ahead and do that. But it's cumbersome and even it's going to be overwhelming because don't forget they're talking about inbound flights. Most times we're going to be going out. And what they also said was if there are issues, they won't hold your passport, but they'll keep you at a particular place. So these mm. are very complex situations that must be looked at. So many uh, questions they are seeking for answers. Now let's come to you, Mr. Shadari, uh, and talk about some mm. flights that were suspended. Tell us more mm. on the infractions committed. What went wrong, as it were? I, I think this um, was um, highly welcomed by, the, by a lot of people because um, aviation is all about reciprocity. Mm. It's all about diplomacy also. Um, you do this to me, I retaliate. I wish the uh, federal government had done this on other uh, fronts, but be that as it may, it was welcome. What really happened was that some European um, um, countries uh, barred Nigeria from coming into their countries for no reason, because they feel that uh, um, the high rate of, uh, or maybe we, they, they, they were not comfortable, or I, I'm just putting it that way, because for you to bar a country that has not recorded as much as uh, the numbers of COVID-19 you recorded, I see no reason why you must stop Nigerians from coming into Europe. People who want to come to Europe, you open your borders to people, but you are not opening your borders to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You're opening your borders to people who are more, who have even recorded more uh, cases of um, COVID-19, and this could also be aeropolitics. And the federal government felt, okay, if you're not opening your borders to us, we are not also going to open our borders to you. It's mm -hmm. tit for tat, and it's welcome in um, aeropolitics. And if you look at what has happened, I think these airlines have more to lose than Nigeria because we don't have um, uh, airlines that, you know, are very, very efficient as um, these European airlines. A lot of them will want to come to Nigeria, but we don't have airlines to reciprocate that. I think it's going to bite harder uh, for them to review uh, their processes or their policies mm. against Nigerians. So I think um, federal government should uh, 
look beyond just what has happened now to correct some anomalies, to correct some imbalances, especially on bilateral air services agreement that is skewed against Nigerian airlines and Nigeria as a country. Right. So what government has done, what the minister has done is highly commendable. I think this is the first time we're having uh, a government that has to look into their, uh, their eyes and say, no, no, you can't continue to treat us this way, you can continue to do this to us. Yeah. I think the last time we had something like this was during uh, the days of General Sani Apacha, where the government at that time decided to stop British Airways in a rather uh, 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 undiplomatic way, just to send a, a big message to them that you can't treat Nigerians or you can't take Nigerians for granted. Right. It's, it is a welcome development. I think as time goes by, the countries that were bad uh, from you know operating their flights into Nigeria we begin to look at these places because they have more to lose. Mm. Nigeria is the good uh, okay. I do not see them holding on for too long without calling Nigerians um, to sit down to resolve these problems. <laughs> okay. I think it's a good thing for us. Right. And those that are able to fly, um, I think 18 or 19 of them, they are welcome, but they are not going to operate into the country on a daily basis mm -hmm. because for now, uh, what they are going to do is that they've restricted it to just uh, 1,280 uh, passengers uh, per day. Mm -hmm. So if you take 1,800 and um, 1,280 passengers for Abuja, you take another 1,280 passengers for um, Lagos. Mm -hmm. So, but as time goes by, we, uh, uh, we, they are going to review all these processes because for now, it seems we don't have capacity to handle as much as uh, so many airlines that want to come to Nigeria. And that is why they restricted that number. But with time, they are going to uh, review that. Okay. And when we have that capacity, they will allow most of the airlines to come in. All right. I, I still do have more questions for you, but uh, let, let, let me also engage Mr. Kunu here. He says that, he, Mr. Shaderi was just saying there that he doesn't think that these countries would hold up for a long time, you know, that you know, they need, so to say, they need Nigerians. Do you agree? Do you think... Well, I agree. Hmm. Uh, if we look at what we spend on education or going to Dubai alone, it's what some countries really, because don't forget that any time we step out, it's in hard currency. Mm. And if we did a conversion of that, uh, that at times could be maybe a ministry's budget or two, three ministries in some of those countries. Uh, I need to say that um, uh, we must understand what our priorities are as a country, as a country rather. These countries will feel it, obviously, because don't forget uh, they've got very functional aviation industries and they have their targets that must be met. Mm -hmm. So a situation where a major country as Nigeria, because we do travel a lot, uh, appears to uh, shut them out, they have to think again about how to get into the country. Don't forget we remain the most populous black country in the world. Uh, that cannot be argued. And Nigeria remains a veritable ground for people to come in, do businesses and also do lots of other things and even go out. So I think that these countries that actually did that, and also do not forget, he said uh, aeropolitics. At of the time, as of the time that these countries placed a ban on Nigeria, I must say that it's also related to the UK Brexit conversations. Because COVID-19 actually uh, started that. Ordinarily, the UK was supposed to exit Brexit uh, maybe by the end of 2020 or the rest of it all. Right. But COVID has actually given them more grace. So when some of those airlines talked about resumption, the UK being a standalone as it were, didn't do that. And don't forget the relationship by virtue of colonialism that exists between Nigeria and the UK. So they didn't touch Nigeria. Mm. And as of that time, I even found out from my findings that some people were still, you know, going through, go, going to the UK as permitted. Yeah, because that's going to lead me to my next question. But okay. I'll allow you to land okay, uh, because please. we have, you know, just wrap up okay, your Okay, so, so, so as far as I'm concerned, I feel that... Uh, they have to take the heat and they won't be able to take it for long mm. because they need the money from here. And don't also forget that many of them got bailouts uh, outside the country, although there are preparations for 
the aviation industry in Nigeria to also get bailouts. So many of them will be looking at the time given for them to start getting back because they won't be able to stay away for so long. Not long. Right, okay. So, uh, and then Mr. Shadare, just follow up with what uh, Mr. Kunu said here. There, there are confusions, you know, on what has been going on before now. Some of the international flights that have been operating, are, are the relevant agents, agencies not aware of this movement? Mm. Come again, please. I didn't get that very well. Okay. I said as a follow-up to what Mr. Kuno was uh, saying about, you know, movements. There were some movements, you know, uh, even during yeah. the uh, heat of the pandemic. Now, there are confusions on what was going on, you know, before now. Some of these international flights that have been operated, does it mean that the relevant agencies were not aware of all of this movement? Okay. The, 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 the operation we had, the operations we had then was... Um, categorized as um, evacuation or emergency flights done by uh, some airlines that um, the federal government engaged and some airlines that um, some other countries like UK, uh, United States, Canada, and uh, India and not the rest, they also had. That was allowed in the sense that, um, yes, Nigeria, the airspace was shut for quite a long time, but mm -hmm. um, people needed to be with their families, people needed to be uh, where they're supposed to be. Some people got caught up in the whole of this and the uh, uh, government gave that window that um, we could have emergency or evacuation flight for people to move, oil workers to leave, emergency workers to leave, um, drugs to come in, cargo to come in. So they were all allowed. There was nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But one thing again was that the process was abused by uh, so many people, especially we had what I could uh, possibly call um, normal uh, flight operation because um, people did um, charter flight operation. Even some people did com pure commercial uh, flights. Uh, I think the, the ministry must have been hoodwinked into believing that everything that went on was um, mm. uh, uh, emergency or evacuation yeah, flight. Flights. flight. So that was where I had problem with them because actually you can't blame the government for because they will present something that looks like um, uh, emergency but not actually emergency and mm -hmm. what they'll do because the government needed to show compassion that no we in as much as we had COVID-19 we couldn't have grounded the economy we couldn't have done we still had a window of opportunity for small businesses to go on for humanitarian services to go on mm -hmm. so did that, but that couldn't in returns be classified as scheduled flight operations. So there are two different things uh, that happened that period, but we've passed that stage. We have gone back to uh, normal flight operation, mm -hmm. although not all the airlines have resumed because of um, they needed to be very careful. They needed to ensure that uh, they could manage some of the airlines that are coming in because it takes a lot to manage uh, for instance, a Boeing uh, 777 with almost 300 or 4, uh, 350 passengers mm. uh, landing, uh, two airlines landing, two aircraft landing at the same time, almost 700 passengers at the same time. So it's quite a huge number. Right. So, But with the capacity we have, with what we have, they said, no, let us see how we can manage this situation before we throw everything open. Okay. So like I said, there are two different things. The evacuation flights were different from mm -hmm. what we have now. Now airlines can begin to do their normal uh, scheduled services. That stage has passed now. So we're looking at what do we have now? Mm -hmm. How do we manage the situations that we have now? All right, let me, let, let me give that, uh, Mr. Okay, Kunu all time. These things are done in an atmosphere, atmosphere of... Uh, good health and uh, all the rest. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shadari. Let me ask you now. So where do we go from here? How do we do it now? Like he was saying, to be sure that everything, you know, due process is followed. To okay, the let me tell you certain things that will happen because I think it's important I, I, I do it. But very uh, quickly. Yes. <laughs> Before the passengers and back on the flight, they pay the money for the second test. They go to the portal. So before you leave your country, you have to get the money is paid, and you have to get a printout where you upload what you should upload. Mm -hmm. When you get here, seven days after, you get a text or that you check your mail for you to be able to get notification so that you can appear for the collection. 
if you look at it, there are certain levels of responsibilities placed on the shoulders of the people who are coming in. So that means somebody who perhaps comes into the country and would have to receive an SMS might actually receive the SMS or not receive the SMS. Right. And the person will be the one to go to that place. What if the person came in and maybe on the day that they schedule the person for the test is a day where the person should meet with business partners in mm. the country or the person could actually get the vehicle or there's traffic. Because these are things that should also be factored into these processes. So I would have thought that immediately passengers arrive, just create an emergency medical to let them take their samples immediately so they can go, then they notify them. Mm -hmm. So I think that we, we could review these particular processes and make things better for us as a country. Right. I like the way you've put it. Review the processes and make things better for us as a country. Thank yes, you so very much, Public Thank Affairs you for Analyst. Me. Thank uh, you very much. And Deni Yekunu. Yeah. And of course, from the other end, uh, who joined us virtually, thank you, Mr. Wale Shadari, for your contributions. As always, do keep stay, uh, stay safe out there. Thank you very much.